Good afternoon. It is an honor and privilege for Town Bank to once again sponsor the State of City Address in Norfolk. I've been fortunate to have been personally involved with the State of the City series for 17 years and have had the pleasure of introducing Paul Frame and describing his biography many times. I will not do that today, but rather will provide you with examples of the importance of Paul's civic and personal leadership on Norfolk and Hampton Roads. When you think about Hampton Roads' future transportation needs, whether you're riding the tide or will soon be making plans to take the train from Harbor Park to Washington, D.C., you are thinking about the results of Paul Frame's leadership. It is his collaborative leadership style and his desire to partner with other Hampton Roads cities which creates opportunities to solve pressing needs in our region. And when it comes to Paul's personal leadership, a recent event speaks volumes. It is the passing of one of our community's most influential and philanthropic leaders, Peter G. Decker, Jr. Pete chose one man to deliver his eulogy, and that man did so with much grace and eloquence. That man is Paul Frame. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the mayor of the city of Norfolk, the Honorable Paul D. Frame. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. All right, Paul. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon. It's great to see everybody. From an earthquake and a hurricane to the successful launch of light rail, 2011 <laughs> was a memorable year. And so it is once again an honor to be with the city's business, civic, and governmental leadership as we review our accomplishments, the challenges before us, and the future that lies ahead. I know my colleagues on the council join me in thanking you for being here and for all you are doing to help make Norfolk a great city. Let me also thank Mike Fowler, the chair of the Norfolk Division, and Jack Hornbeck, CEO of the Hampton Roads Chamber of Commerce for organizing this annual event. Before going any further, it is appropriate to note the passing two weeks ago today of a beloved Norfolk figure, Peter G. Decker, Jr. Peter loved the city of Norfolk deeply. His people were his extended family, and he spent most of his adult life helping make it a better place to live and work. Peter was generous with his time and with his resources. He was immensely popular and bigger than life and succeeded in leaving the city a better place than he found it. We will all miss him greatly and already do. God bless you, Peter. It's said that diversity brings out the best in people. Last August, city employees gave meaning to that adage during and after Hurricane Irene. Across the board, their response was outstanding. So I'd like to take this opportunity to extend thanks and appreciation from the council and, for, and the community for a job well done. Will all of the city employees please stand? Thank you. 2011 also marked the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. In observance of that tragic day, the city joined with the Navy, the Marines, and the Coast Guard for a day of healing and remembrance in Town Point Park. The ceremony served as a reminder of the dangerous world we live in and of how much we owe the men and women of our armed forces for all they do to keep, to keep us safe at home by defending our freedoms abroad. We are honored to have representatives from the military with us today, including Vice Admiral Tony Johnson Burt, Chief of Staff, NATO Supreme Allied Command Transformation, Rear Admiral Stephen Mayling, Commander, U.S. Coast Guard Readiness Command, and Captain David Culler, Executive Officer, Naval Station Norfolk, as well as Fred Cresilius, the Executive Director, Navy Region, Mid-Atlantic. According to a recent national study, Norfolk is the second, second best place in the country <clears throat> to look for a job for persons retiring from the armed forces. This is due to our job mix, our low unemployment, and affordable home prices. We look forward to working with our friends in the military to make Norfolk an even more desirable place for both active duty and retired personnel. With American troops out of Iraq and the war in Afghanistan winding down, 
we expect to welcome home a growing number of veterans. We are glad to have them back as a part of our community and as a part of our economy. Some will enroll in college, some will go back to families and careers, many will need jobs. All possess skills needed in the public and private sectors. To assist their transition to civilian life, the city is establishing a workforce development and veteran services initiative within the Department of Economic De Development. Additionally, the council has agreed to appoint a military economic development advisory committee to provide guidance for the program and to, to enhance coordination between the city and the Navy and to grow the military's presence here. We will, we will also establish a separate commission on veterans affairs to advise us on issues and concerns that affect veterans and their families. The city manager is also organizing staff around these initiatives. The goal is for Norfolk to be the best city in the country for the military to do business and for veterans to live and work. As future rounds of BRAC are being contemplated, a strong showing of community support is necessary to demonstrate to decision makers that Norfolk and Hampton Roads should remain the military capital of the world. It is also worth mentioning again the good news we learned Monday that Norfolk will remain the only home port for all of the Navy's East Coast nuclear aircraft carriers. Yep. Good sense has finally prevailed over politics. <laughs> Thanks to our entire congressional delegation for making this point for us so firmly. And if we learned anything last year, it was that the city is also a good football town. The Norfolk State Spartans captured the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference Championship and an automatic berth to the FCS playoffs. Across town, the Old Dominion University Monarchs secured the school's first playoff spot in only their third football season. History was made when both teams met at Foreman Field in the first round of the playoffs. And while Old Dominion prevailed, NSU, ODU, and the city all came away winners. Beginning in 2013, the teams are scheduled to begin a six-year stand, which will be great for all of us. Today, we are pleased to have with us Old Dominion University President John Broderick and head football coach Bobby Wilder, who's the college sports madness national coach of the year. Joining coach Wilder is Chris Krause, the director of football operations, linebacker Craig Wilkins, defensive lineman Chris Burnett, and wide receiver Reed Evans. And here from Norfolk State University is its new president. We want to welcome Dr. Tony Atwater. Head football coach Pete Adrian, the MEAC coach of the year, was unable to join us, but he is represented by assistant head coach Rod Holder and assistant coach Paul Macklin, along with defensive tackle Josh Turner and offensive lineman Blake Matthews. Please join me in congratulating both teams for great seasons. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Speaking of Norfolk State, NSU Athletic Director Marty Miller is also here today. We were together two weeks ago for the announcement that the MEAC basketball tournament will return to Norfolk next March after a 15-year absence. With 13 teams, including local powerhouses Norfolk State and Hampton University, competing in the tournament, thousands of fans from around the country will visit Scope for some of the best college basketball anywhere. As home to the conference's headquarters, we are very pleased to once again host this prestigious tournament. We are also glad to learn that ODU will be hosting the NCAA Women's Basketball Regional Semifinal and Finals next year, with the winner going to the Final Four. So that proves that Norfolk is also a good basketball town. There's someone else I want to recognize who's given a lifetime to sports, and that someone is Dave Rosenfield. He's one of baseball's living, le living legends who this fall stepped aside as general manager of the Tides, a position he has held since 1963. Wow. In recognition of his more than 50 years in professional baseball and his numerous contributions to the Tides and the city, I'm pleased to announce that a piece of public art capturing the likeness of Dave, okay, will be commissioned for installation at Harbor Park. So Dave, will you please stand so we can thank you. Thank you right out here. 
Thank you, Dave. As we look out over the next several years, there's much to be confident about in the state of our city. Norfolk's economic fundamentals remain sound, our budget is well managed, and local revenues have begun to recover with hotels, meals, admissions, and retail sales tax all showing positive growth. Holiday retail sales were up 4.5% this year. Our population is growing, and aggressive economic development policy has strengthened our tax base and protected our job core. And this has significantly helped reduce the poverty rate. We are a safer city and one that is improving the quality of life for all citizens. When the books were closed on the fiscal year 2011 budget, we found a modest but significant $11 million surplus. Projections are this year's budget will end with a surplus of more than $8 million. That's what the manager says. <laughs> Maybe more. These surpluses were generated in the teeth of the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression and demonstrate good stewardship of the public's purse. The 2010 census showed that our population grew by 8,400 people. That's a 3.6 percent increase. That rate of growth exceeded most of our neighbors and reversed a 30-year trend where our population was either declining or flat. And we just learned from the Commonwealth that in 2011, we added 1,200 more folks, bringing our population to nearly 244,000. Our population is growing, and that's a very positive development for us. In a clear-cut sign of our economy's strength, the city's total assessed property value stands at nearly $18 billion, and that's double that of eight years ago, and a major achievement considering we're over 90% developed. And that increase also occurred during a national recession. We are doing better than most on our real estate values. We've worked hard to expand the economy and our tax base. And that is what has enabled us to provide our citizens with more tax relief in the past seven years than any other city in Hampton Roads. Underscoring our position as the business, educational, medical, and cultural hub of Southeastern Virginia, Norfolk continues to lead the region in total average compensation per job. According to the most recent figures from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the average compensation per job, and that's wages and benefits combined, is $72,696, an amount 3.2% higher than last reported. And there are nearly 213,000 jobs in Norfolk, one for every adult resident. And very few cities in America can make such a claim. But still, we need to do a better job of connecting Norfolk residents to Norfolk jobs. And that's something we've said before. So today, I'm pleased to report progress in that direction through Employ Norfolk. That's a program out of our Economic Development Department with the goal of reducing unemployment. This will be achieved by increasing awareness of job openings and job training opportunities, by reaching out to the city's unemployed, by encouraging businesses to create apprenticeship positions, by increasing in enrollment in technical education programs, and by increasing the number of GED recipients. Employers and projects have already been identified that will need skilled workers over the next four years. By matching unemployment residents, unemployed residents with available jobs, we hope to lower the unemployment rate. The expectation is that this will further reduce the poverty rate for Norfolk families which I'm glad to say has dropped 34% in the last 10 years. In other words, in the last decade, the number of families living in poverty declined by over 2,700 families in Norfolk. This bucks a national trend for core cities where poverty is actually increasing. At the same time, poverty has become less concentrated in areas across the city. A recent Brookings Institution report states that over the last 10 years, most metro areas saw an increase in the number of neighborhoods with very high poverty rates. Norfolk experienced just the opposite. Here, the number of census tracts, with at least 40% of residents living below poverty, was cut from 10 to 8. Research demonstrates areas with high concentrations of poverty experienced more crime, less investment, and fewer employment options. So this is a very positive development for Norfolk and a trend that we are determined to continue. 
We care about everyone in this city, including the poor. And while we have made strides in lifting many out of poverty and improving everyone's quality of life, we are compelled to do more so that everyone in this city moves forward together. And towards this end, I will ask the City Council to establish an anti-poverty task force to focus on the causes of poverty and unemployment in Norfolk and to recommend to Council by this time next year strategies to lift greater numbers of our citizens out of poverty. This effort will help focus and coordinate our energies to assist the poor and the unemployed. And when their report is received next year, strategies recommended can be funded in the 2014 budget. Norfolk is also becoming a safer city. Total crime since 2002 is down nearly 22%. Since 2008, violent crime alone is down 33%. That's a third in three years. So thanks to our public safety officers for the great work they do. And thanks to our citizens and businesses for supporting the police. One measure of, of a great city is how it cares for its most vulnerable citizens, the homeless and those in danger of falling into homelessness. Now in its sixth year, our effort to end homelessness continues to make headway. Last year, our homeless action and response team ended or prevented homelessness for over 1,400 adults and children. The success rate for those exiting homelessness was 90%. And while those needing prevention services experienced a 94% success rate. Another way we are acting to end homelessness is by providing supportive housing through a regional partnership with our sister jurisdictions. Today, there are 180 units of permanent supportive housing at locations in Norfolk, Virginia Beach, and Portsmouth. Five years ago, none existed. And just last week, ground was broken on another 60 units in Chesapeake. We are working on identifying a site for a second development in Norfolk. This led the Christian Science Monitor to recognize Norfolk in an article just last month as one of four cities in the country that have made a significant impact in ending chronic homelessness by using permanent supportive housing. Thank you. Norfolk continues to, be, to gain recognition as one of the country's most desirable places to live. The Port of Virginia, the third largest on the East Coast and poised for strong growth, makes us a leading city for international trade, commerce, and business. Citing our quality of life, our economic potential, and our business-friendly attitude and other assets, FDI Intelligence Magazine rated Norfolk as one, as one of the top 10 small cities of the future and as a top 10 city for a foreign direct investment strategy. Affirming this decision, last year, Belgian global logistics provider KTN invested $12 million for a warehousing and distribution operation on a portion of the former Ford assembly plant site. Build out of the facility concludes next month. When fully staffed, it will create about 200 jobs. And KTN holds an option to acquire an additional 25 acres to accommodate its phase two expansion plans. Joining us today is Kathleen Brackney, president of KTN Specialty Chemicals USA, Frank Vingerhoots, president of KTN Gulf Coast, and Gordon Campbell, the terminal manager for KTN Norfolk. So please help me in welcoming our new, newest international business. Private and public developments have, have effectively strengthened and diversified the city's economy with, help, with well over a half billion dollars in economic activity completed, begun, or announced in just the last five years alone. This does not include light rail. Four medical projects accounted for more than $240 million of investment. They included a $126 million expansion and remodeling of Centara Lee Hospital a $25 million medical office building on the DePaul Medical Center campus, a $10 million addition and remodeling at Lake Taylor, Lake Taylor Transitional Care Hospital, and Eastern Virginia Medical School's $80 million education and research building. This new facility at EVMS allows for a 30% enrollment increase in the, in the MD class and is home to the Centara Center for Simulation and Immersive Learning. EVMS is a vital asset for Norfolk and Hampton Roads. 
It annually provides millions, tens of millions of dollars, in fact, in charitable services. It exerts a regional economic impact approaching $1 billion. And with nearly 1,400 employees, it is one of the city's largest employers. Under Harry Lester's leadership, the medical school has become financially secure, has greatly improved its facilities, and has enhanced its reputation as a center for medical research. President Lester is here today, so please join me in thanking him. Harry, thanks for everything. Uh, also here from the medical school is Dr. Richard Homan, who last September was appointed provost and dean, so let's welcome him to the city as well. Doctor, thanks. A priceless benefit of the medical school is, the many students, is that many students remain here after graduation. Right now, nearly 1,000 EVMS alumni live in the area, 300 and 350 in Norfolk. And I don't know what we would do without them or without the medical school. And thousands of Hampton Roads families would tell you they don't know what they would have done without Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters, which this year celebrates 50 years of pro providing excellent medical care to young people. So congratulations to them and to a cherished health care institution. <laughs> Major downtown developments such as the Wells Fargo Center and Monticello Station Apartments, Harbor Heights Condominiums, the Belmont at Freemason, the Residence Inn by Marriott, and Tidewater Community College's new student center have brought with them new jobs and new residents while generating new revenue. The Student Center is a first for TCC. Enrollment is up again for the 14th consecutive year to 14,700 students on the Norfolk campus. TCC has blossomed under the excellent leadership of its president, Debbie DeCroce. After almost 14 years, she departs at the end of the month to lead another vital institution, the Hampton Roads Community Foundation. So please join me in thanking Dr. DeCroce for all she has done for thousands of our young people. I also want to note that Virginia Wesleyan College celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2011. Been around a while. At that time, Virginia Wesleyan has become one of the nation's best liberal arts colleges. President Dr. Billy Greer is here today. So please join me in congratulating him and Virginia Wesleyan on this milestone. Even in tough times, cities must invest in their future. Last month, ground was broken on the long-awaited courts complex. It's a $121 million project. In a matter of months, we'll break ground on the $62 million Colonel Samuel L. Slover Memorial Library. It's a project we were able to advance by at least a decade on the strength of the largest philanthropic gift in the city's history from Frank Batten Sr. and the Batten family. During construction, these two projects will create an estimated 1,500 jobs with an annual average wage of 36,300. When the Slover Library opens in just over two years, we will have a state-of-the-art main library featuring the most advanced technology of any such facility in the country. It will, in fact, be a national and local treasure. This was Frank Batten Sr.'s vision when he donated $20 million for the purpose of building this library that has been named for his uncle and the former Norfolk mayor. Jane Batten shares this vision, and that is why she pledged an additional $20 million to expand and improve this stream. The pledge was made on condition of her matching $5 for every $1 raised. And so today I am pleased to report that a successful fundraising drive has raised more than the $4 million needed to match Mrs. Batten's challenge. And last week, last Friday actually, the Slover Library Foundation received Jane's pledge of $20 million from the Batten Foundation. The Batten's family commitment to this city and other projects important to this city's well-being have improved the quality of life for generations of Norfolk residents. And on behalf of a grateful city, I want to extend to them our thanks and appreciation. But we are not done yet with this. The highly sophisticated nature of the technology at the Slover 
will require constant attention. The Slover Library requires its own endowment so as not to compete with the other needs of the city. The same folks who raised the $4 million I mentioned earlier to match the challenge grant have not slowed. They are mostly former landmark employees who are committed to realizing this vision for Frank and Jane. The goal is to raise another $10 million for a technology reserve fund. This can and I'm certain will be accomplished. Across from the Slover, construction on the $6.3 million MacArthur Memorial's new visitor center is on track for a summer completion. This addition was made possible through a partnership with the General Douglas and MacArthur Foundation, and we greatly appreciate its support of the memorial and its mission. When Waterside opened in 1983, it was with the hope that it would ignite the revitalization of the downtown waterfront, and ultimately of downtown itself. By any objective measure, it achieved both goals. Along the way, it became a beloved symbol of Norfolk's renaissance, a place thousands of people feel a sense of ownership, even today. But all the new development that it inspired also held the seeds of its decline. Waterside became a victim of its own success. As the city began, began to consider Waterside's future, we first sought the public's input. We learned that many wanted to be, to be maintained as a family-oriented destination with dining, shopping, and entertainment. Others suggested totally new uses for the site. Next, we saw proposals from developers, and last month they were shared with the public. The manager is preparing to make a recommendation to the council, after which we will seek additional public comment. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. We need to take the time to make sure we get the decision right. Whatever is done with Waterside, it must serve the city at least as, as well and as long as the original facility. The performing arts are helping make Norfolk attractive to businesses, to young professionals, and the creative class. Productions by the Virginia Symphony, which is the hardest working orchestra in America, the Virginia Opera, Virginia Stage, the Virginia Arts Festival are equal to the best anywhere and have made Norfolk the envy of much larger cities. Following last year's record attendance, the Arts Festival has grown, has, <clears throat> has produced another great program in store for this season, featuring world acclaimed soprano Renee Fleming, legendary Itzhak Perlman, the American Ballet Theater, and Academy Award winner and film acting legend Al Pacino. Don't be alarmed by the orange glow inside the building at Duke and Gray Streets. That's the furnace of the Chrysler Museum's new glass studio made possible by generous contributions. Other gifts will enable construction to begin this spring on a $20 million expansion and for free admission forever all reinforcing the Chrysler's position as one of the nation's leading art museums. Funding from the city's Arts and Humanities Commission supports performance of more than 40 community arts organizations, like the Hurrah Players and the I. Sherman Green Chorale and the Hampton Roads Chamber Players. And our public art program is, is bringing visual art into public spaces across the city. Norfolk is also home to the Governor's School for the Arts, and its amazing center nurturing the artistic creativity of hundreds of young people around the region. And you just heard from Jermaine earlier. And their alumni are appearing in Broadway productions and on the hit TV show Glee. To consolidate its campus downtown, the city is working with the school to renovate the historic Monroe Building on Granby Street. Further down Granby Street, U.S. Development reports that at long last, HUD has advised that this month they will close on a loan that will enable work to begin on a $22 million renovation of the Union Mission Building. When completed next spring, this National Registered Historic Landmark will rejoin downtown in its life as the Rockefeller, a 90-unit apartment building. So thanks to U.S. development for staying the course and saving this historic building. A great development for the city was the decision by Los Angeles-based AECOM, the largest architectural engineering and consulting company in the world to bring its regional headquarters and 155 employees with compensation packages averaging $99,000 to the Wells Fargo Center, where it will occupy an entire floor. That's right, $99,000. It is the first corporate headquarters to locate downtown since Maersk Line Limited in 2004. 
AECOM cited light rail as one reason for consolidating its operations here, which will also include a new division. Employees should start arriving next month. AECOM Regional Manager Daryl Henderson and leaders from the local office are with us today. So please join me in welcoming them and all AECOM employees to Norfolk. We also look forward to welcoming urban outfitters to downtown and to Hampton Roads, a hip lifestyle specialty retailer offering fashion apparel and home goods. Urban Outfitters will occupy 14,000 square foot of space and three floors on Granby Street, one block away, and it is in a direct line of sight to the MacArthur Center. Urban Outfitters could have gone anywhere in the region. Its decision to locate in downtown Norfolk says much about us and what we have accomplished together. Thanks to Bobby Wright, DNC, and all involved for striking this deal. With new development <clears throat> valued at $29 million now either underway or announced, Ward's Corner is beginning to experience some long-awaited positive change. The city recently invested $2.7 million to acquire seven dilapidated apartment buildings in Denby Park, and construction has begun on Norfolk Collegiate's amazing $8.5 million fine arts building and what qualifies as the most significant development in years for the heart of the Ward's Corner Business District. Developer Chris Perry recently announced plans for a new $18 million shopping center to be anchored by a Harris Teeter. Demolition of the existing center on the southeast corner of Granby Street and Little Creek Road is scheduled to begin this summer. And this culminates years of work by the Perry family to purchase properties needed to proceed and plans are for the center to open in 2014. Chris Perry is with us this afternoon, so please join me in thanking him for this significant investment. Chris, thanks. We were also very pleased to learn of the decision by the Tidewater Builders Association to hold its fall homorama in East Beach for an unprecedented third time. Today, this 100-acre residential bayfront development is valued at more than $313 million. And that's a nice return for an initial $55 million investment. East Beach has won national awards for its design. It's hosted two coastal living idea houses. And even in a difficult housing market, lot and home sales are robust. All of these new developments, AECOM's regional headquarters, redevelopment of the Ford plant, urban outfitters, the changes occurring at Ward's Corner, and the great things happening in Ocean View, along with the investments and new jobs they represent, are a strong sign of confidence in the direction of the city and its future. Our public school system is one of the most important, it was one of our most important assets, and one we will all need to help succeed. In the hyper-connected 21st century economy, the passport to the best jobs and to the middle class is a college diploma. For the vast majority of young people, the gateway to college is through the public school system. So let's be clear. Norfolk Public Schools is providing an education equal to the best anywhere. As evidence looked no further than the six Norfolk elementary schools recently selected for awards of excellence by the State Board of Education, or Norview High's Schools of Blue Ribbon Awards, or the number of seniors or accepted to colleges or the $25 million in scholarships they were awarded last year. But system-wide, a stubborn problem exists. Too many of our students are not achieving at benchmark levels, too many are not graduating on time, and too many are dropping out. The school system has put in place strategies to address these issues, and the council is working with them. Norfolk continues to lead the region in per-pupil expenditures. Our teacher salaries remain competitive regionally. We are investing tens of millions of dollars for new schools, including nearly $30 million for a new Crossroads Elementary that will be ready this summer. Two weeks ago, the council gave the school board the go-ahead to proceed with the construction of two new elementary schools. And as soon as planning is finished, we will fund construction of two additional schools. Academic excellence, however, comes with a price. We cannot expect our schools to absorb budget cuts of tens of millions of dollars without a decline in quality. In this year's budget, the council will need to address this loss in state funding with local dollars. 
And even though the proposed budget presented by the school administration this past Wednesday did not include raises for employees, we know we must do better. After four years of no pay increases, both school and city employees need and deserve raises. And our salaries, got an employee out there. And our salaries must stay competitive in our marketplace. Next year's budget should include additional funds for both school and city employees to have appropriate raises. A key measure of a community's quality of life is the availability of recreational opportunities that appeal to all ages. Last year, several new projects began that will expand our rec recreational amenities. They include a $500,000 expansion and renovation of the Therapeutic Recreation Center, startup of a new $7.7 million Southside Aquatic Center, a splash park at the Northview Recreation Center, and a $1.9 million gymnasium at Ingleside Elementary School that will also be available to the public. Additionally, the city provided the land for the YMCA to build a new $13 million facility in Park Place that will include the region's most advanced early childhood training center, learning center. The most significant recreational project in the city's history got underway October 31st when ground was broken for the Salvation Army's Ray and Joan Croc Corps Community Center at Broad Creek. This $84 million 80,000 square foot facility includes a $28 million endowment to fund its ongoing operation. Many individuals and organizations work to bring a Croc Center to Norfolk. They include Major Lewis Reckline and the Salvation Army Board and staff, the Croc Foundation itself, and especially Josh Starden, who led the private fundraising drive for the center's endowment. They also include Vice Mayor Anthony Burford, who worked so hard at this for so long members of the business community, the Hampton Roads Community Foundation, and the Batten Foundation, again, along with the Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority and the city. So we want to thank all of you for this tremendous effort. Thank you. <laughs> the young and the not so young love to visit the zoo. And recently, the Virginia Zoo has become a visitor magnet with last May's opening of the major new exhibit, Trail of the Tiger, it is now a world-class zoological institution solidly at the forefront as one of America's best medium-sized zoos. Growing a world-class zoo adds significantly to the city's and the region's quality of life. It also acts as an economic driver, and here's a case in point. In 2011, the zoo drew over half a million visitors. That's a 23% increase and saw a 40% increase in revenue. The zoo is presently deep into plans for a $4 million animal wellness center, and a, and a groundbreaking is being planned for this spring. So congratulations to the Zoo Society and everyone involved in this great success story. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. As a city nearly surrounded by water, flooding has become a part of Norfolk, has always been a part of Norfolk's history. Due to rising sea levels and sinking property, it has become recently a chronic and expensive problem, with some areas regularly flooding at high tide and during heavy rainfall. In response, the city has raised roadbeds, improved drainage, and replaced old stormwater pipes. This year, we will spend more than $7 million on flood mitigation projects, more than double the amount spent last year. But solving our flooding problem will take time and hundreds of millions of dollars. The cost for just four projects, that's one at The Hague, at Pretty Lake in East uh, Ocean View, Mason Creek, and the Ohio Creek near Norfolk State University, is estimated to be upwards of $300 million. The staggering cost of, these, of this challenge requires federal assistance. As a first step in applying for federal funds, we've asked the General Assembly to commission a study on sea level rise and flooding in Virginia shoreline and coastal communities. When funded, Old Dominion University has offered to work with us, and we will be working with us with, uh, together on a study. We've also partnered with ODU's Climate Change and Sea Level Rise Initiative, and are working with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Good progress is being made, but the sheer size and cost of the problem requires years to address. 
Tomorrow will be the sixth month anniversary since we cut the ribbon on light rail on August the 18th. Norfolk is the smallest city in America to build such a transit system. On behalf of everyone who did so much heavy lifting, I'm proud to report that work, work week ridership has averaged 4,650 a day for these six months. That's far exceeding, far exceeding. That far exceeds the original FTA projection of 2,900 improving light rail to be a viable transportation alternative. The encouraging ridership numbers mean additional revenue for operation, but also the cost of operating the light rail has proven to be less than budgeted. All of this improves the city's bottom line. Its cost, $317 million, makes it the least expensive light rail system built on a per mile basis in recent times in this country. A little discussed fact, is that of this amount, our federal and state partners have paid 83%. The city contributed but 17 cents of every dollar, an excellent leverage of local funds, especially so when you take into account that over time we will recoup much of that investment from revenues generated by transit-oriented development and increased economic activity. HRT President and CEO Phil Chiquette led the effort to complete construction and lower operating costs. We appreciate the great work he did as HRT's leader. And we're pleased to welcome today HRT's new president and CEO, William Harrell, and look forward to working with him and building our transit network. Bill, I hope you're here. I think you're here. <laughs> Though built entirely in Norfolk, this light rail system does not bear Norfolk's name. It is not called the Norfolk Light Rail Line. From its conception, it was planned to be a regional transit system. It was named the Tide, so our friends in other cities would freely welcome it into their communities. And when they are ready, we hope and believe our friends will invite the Tide to Virginia Beach. There's, oh, there's Mayor Sessoms. I didn't, okay. That, that one's, okay. <laughs> And Mayor Krasnoff is out there, and Mayor Wright, and Mayor Johnson, and we, there's a whole bunch up here, okay. The tide has already leveraged one extremely important regional transit decision. Every community in Hampton Roads, that's all the guys in this room, all the people, all the folks in this room from across the region, voted to support intercity passenger rail coming to the south side at Harbor Park in Norfolk, where our light rail system operates. That vote occurred on October 30th, 2009. The Department of Rail and Public Transportation is led very ably by Thelma Drake. She is a former member of the Virginia General Assembly and the U.S. Congress and a Norfolk native and knows everyone. She's helped to organize DR DRPT, has organized all of the appropriate players to bring intercity inter passenger rail here faster than anyone could have hoped. With $114 million in state funding and the agreement and cooperation of Norfolk Southern and CSX, these guys work together. Improvements along the alignment to uh, Petersburg and Richmond are ahead of schedule. This will allow passenger service from Norfolk to Washington and points north to begin this December, nearly a year earlier than projected. This will be a game changer for the residents, businesses, and military on the south side and solidify Norfolk's role as the transportation hub of all of Hampton Roads. Later this year, construction begins at Harbor Park on a multimodal passenger station where bus, ferry, light rail, and passenger rail will connect, helping fulfill the dream of seamless passenger rail service operating out of Southampton Roads. This has been achieved with support from Governor McDonnell, the General Assembly, the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, Norfolk Southern, CSX, Amtrak, and all of the cities in the region. So please join me in thanking the following folks who are with us today. Our hero, Thelma Drake. Jim Squires, the CFO of Norfolk Southern. Jay MacArthur, who is the Principal Officer, Contract Administrator for Amtrak. And Quentin Kendall, CSX's Regional Vice President for State Government Affairs. Thank you very much. Let's give them a great round of applause.
So just imagine, I mean, if progress continues at this pace, inner city rail will be operating in time for this holiday season. With 41,000 cars using the Midtown Tunnel daily, it is the most heavily traveled two-lane road in Virginia and the most congested. At any moment, a breakdown can bring the entire road system in Hampton Roads to a crawl. This is an impediment to our regional economy, military preparedness, and the port's efficiency. The expansion of the Midtown Tunnel has been the chief transportation priority of the region for decades. A $2.1 billion agreement between the Commonwealth and the Elizabeth River crossings to build a second Midtown Tunnel is the first major transportation project approved for Hampton Roads since work on the Monitor Merrimack Bridge Tunnel began in 1985. Construction is planned to begin by the end of this year. Progress on the expansion of the tunnel has come at a high price. Some would say at too high a price. We can continue to argue about methods of financing road and tunnel improvements, but the fact is the debate, that debate has been going on for decades, and we are no closer to agreement. Many do not agree with the tolls, and I don't blame you. I certainly, Mayor Wright uh, would argue that. But we pay a toll for doing nothing, a toll on our economic activity, a toll on our air quality, a toll on our time spent away from our loved ones while stuck in traffic, and a toll on gas-guzzled idling and backups. It's also true that we need this new tunnel if for no other reason than to help evacuate the south side in case of a natural or man-made disaster. Let's continue to search for a solution to our woefully underfunded transportation needs. Let's improve the Public-Private Transportation Act to provide for more transparency and community input. Let's hope efforts in the General Assembly to lower the tolls bear fruit, but let's build this tunnel now. This June marks the 200th anniversary of the War of 1812, a war with England that Norfolk and our neighbor Portsmouth played a key part in at the Battle of Craney Island. To commemorate the bicentennial beginning June 6th and continuing through June 12th, Norfolk and other Hampton Roads port communities will host Op Sail 2012. That's a week long, maybe more, celebration featuring tall ships from dozens of nations, U.S. Navy ships, a parade of sail, an air show, and more exciting events. This signature event for Virginia is being made possible through a partnership between the U.S. Navy, Operation Sail Inc., the Commonwealth of Virginia, the city of Norfolk, and in fact all of the cities in Hampton Roads, the beach, Portsmouth, Chesapeake, everybody's in, Suffolk. It's going to be a world-class, once-in-a-lifetime event that will put our region and the Commonwealth on the international stage and demonstrate again that the Port of Virginia is one of the world's great ports. It will bring tens of thousands of visitors to Norfolk and will lend a significant boost to our hospitality industry. So get ready, and if you're able, get involved, and thanks go to Karen Sherberger for all the work she has done in pulling this together. Karen, I think you're here as well. Okay. With help from each of you here today, with each passing year, we are making steady progress in building a better Norfolk. With a startup of light rail operations, the imminent expansion of the Midtown Tunnel, and with passenger rail service to Washington set to begin later this year, we are seeing real improvements to our transportation network. Our downtown is growing, and so is our population, as more people are choosing to live in Norfolk. Our economy is on the rebound. Our tax base has expanded. Fewer people are living below the poverty line. Our taxes are lower. The city is safer. And our quality of life continues to improve. As a city, we are living, with, living within our means. The future is brighter. And it is my honor to serve alongside my colleagues on city council as together we work with you to make Norfolk one of the world's great cities, a place of opportunity, a center for international commerce with broad support from our residents and our businesses. And this is why I can say with confidence that the state of our city is sound. So thank you for your commitment and for all you do to make Norfolk a better home for our families, for our children, and for our grandchildren.
That's my new grandson, by the way. With that. God bless you, and God bless the city of Norfolk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.